Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Welcome to Insights and Sound, live from Synthplex 2022 in Burbank, California. My guest is the illustrious, the one and only Michael Bradford. One and only. That's because nobody wanted a second one, you know. Well, actually, I believe there must be another Michael Bradford somewhere in the world, and he's probably getting your mail. He's getting my money, too, because it's my son. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note, okay, maybe we need to interview him. Yeah, bring Um, him in here. Michael is a bass player of some repute, as well as a composer, and um, God, you've done all sorts of stuff. You know, you're a man about town. You know, the guy who likes to keep busy. Basically, yeah, yeah. You know. So let's delve a little bit into just um, some of your musical background first. Well, I started out in Detroit, like most people do, as a musician. I was. And, I didn't uh, start out in Detroit. Well, like I said, most people. Oh, know, okay. We yeah. still got to work. Anybody who really matters started out in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. All the New best, Yorkers. <laughs> all the best people. No, but uh, I started out in Detroit a long time ago playing guitar and, and uh, bass and stuff. And it was the same for most musicians back then, in, you know, just being a musician, playing in bands, and trying to get good, you know. And I think the one difference between my generation, which was the 60s and 70s, um, and today is our goal really was just to be good musicians mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to being famous or being rich or having like your own deal with Pepsi or a pants or jeans or jewelry, you know, that kind of thing. It was like the thought of licensing and marketing didn't exist. No, you just wanted to touch people. You just wanted yeah. to get your music out there. Yeah. yeah, and be known as a good musician. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so our heroes were people like James Jamerson and... and you know, people who were on a lot of records. You know, we, I would look mm-hmm. at record album covers and read the liner notes and, you know, oh, who played on this, who played on that. And, sure. And, man, I'd love to be like that. I'd love to do that kind of stuff. And eventually um, meeting uh, other musicians who had bands and, and starting to play around town and make a little bit of cash, but also just try to get um, a name out, you know, like word of mouth. The whole business, that's one thing that hasn't changed about the entertainment business. It's still all word of mouth. It's networking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And someone will say... That that word didn't exist back then, but I think it really is. It comes down to just who you know and who knows who they know. Well, it's an old cliche, but there's this one guy said, if you're not not networking, then you're not working, you know? And because networking is, every job is supposed to lead to another job. Mm-hmm. Every gig is supposed to lead to another gig. Every time someone says, hey, I really needed somebody for bass, or, and they say, well, have you heard Mike? He's, I heard him, and I can say, yeah. you know, he's, yeah. he's, that's what makes the difference. And I trust your judgment, et cetera. Right, yeah. and mm-hmm. you wouldn't, because the other thing about this business has always been that, one, it's word of mouth, but it's also, your own reputation for recommending. Yeah. You know, and I think everybody has been burned at least once making a recommendation that turned out to be a nightmare. And then it's like, why did you do that to me? (laughs) Why did you, you know, why did you tell me, why did you send me this problem? This loser. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you some absolute nightmare stories over the years of people who really didn't work out. Well, and and now that, actually plays into what you were just talking about, though, yeah. because now, as you say, people are more business savvy. Right. And I think back in the earlier days of the industry, it was more laissez-faire. It was more, you know, man, we just want to go out and have a good time. And so there were a lot of people who didn't necessarily learn a lot of the aspects of professionalism. Right. And I think, that, you know, the, those of us who did are still working. Yeah, basically. I mean, you're still alive. You're still in the game. You're <laughs> yeah. still, yeah. you know, because bad news still travels faster than good news. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. and people tend, it's like, like what's that, um, that uh, Yelp, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah. Bad reviews. All the bad reviews yeah. go to the top. <laughs> it's true, man. It's true. I mean, when somebody's really happy with what they got, they don't often write about it. Yeah. But when they're not happy, they want the world to know. 
Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. So I think it's the same thing. You know. I want to talk to your manager. Ne never. Yeah. Mind. Bring yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> it's too hot in here. Now it's too cold. Do yeah. something. Yeah. So I think it really does. Um, it really does apply. But you know. So from that, eventually, some of my buddies started getting better gigs, different gigs, um, and I met a guy who worked at a recording studio in Detroit. And the main thing they did was. Um, in the daytime, they did a lot of com commercials, radio, television, jingles, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a very busy studio. And at night, they had like recording sessions for like music. And so back then, Anita Baker would use this particular studio, Bob Seeger used this studio, um, the few superstar types that still lived in Detroit, because most people, when they got that big, would move away, usually to California or something. But they still lived in Detroit. And so I ended up getting a, a, a bit of a job at that studio. And, uh, cause as an I, engineer? Or? Well, at, at first as a gopher, you uh -huh. know, just a guy doing whatever. Plug yeah. this cable in, run down the street, get us a, a bag of this mm -hmm. um, and, um, or a box of that. Um, and uh, don't touch anything, you know. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and don't forget the papers. And don't forget the papers, you know. <laughs> and then uh, would eventually it's like, okay, I need you to plug this thing into that jack. Right, don't, not the other one, this one. Uh -huh. And if uh -huh. you don't mess that up, okay, now I'll let you have two cables. You know, mm, it, was a, yeah. it was one of those deals where you Learning by doing. Learning by doing, but yeah. also a little bit at a time. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. Suzuki music method where you you know like you'd carry your instrument for a year before they let you play it yeah you know? yeah so the whole idea was just if you can be trusted with a little even the bible says it if you can be trusted with a little then you can be trusted with a lot and um so the whole point is just let's see what you can do yeah. and don't mess that up okay we'll give you a little more to do well but not just that but also let's see your, what your attitude is well, it's all part of the it's all part of the same thing mm -hmm. because there's some people who i think i see more of it these days where people want to be um, number one on day one. Yeah. You know, yeah. how can I be the producer? Well, first, you see, there's already this guy over there. That's the producer. Yeah. Well, how can I take his place? Well, you can't, you see. That's the problem. Right. You can't just walk in here trying to... You need but, to learn a little bit yeah, first. Yeah, but a lot of people do, and then things go wrong for them. So I think that um, I think the key is to just go one step at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it's harder now because people don't go into music or entertainment all the time just to be really good at it. Because word got out. Some people get a lot of money. Some yeah. people become really rich. Some people, and people think, well, that's really fun, you know. But you see that also in the people who work behind the scenes. You know, guys who used to have record companies like Ahmed Erdogan and those guys, they weren't thinking I'm gonna be rich. They were thinking, I love blues, I love jazz, I love whatever style they love. And I wanna release this music to the world and other people can hear it. Well, it's always been axiomatic that if you, if you are looking at it from the perspective of making money, right, you're not going to make the money you want no, to make. No, no. But if you're looking at it out of love for yeah. what you want to do, yeah. And also, I think you know, there's a certain philosophy of how much is enough. You know, well, yeah. I mean, because we live in, especially here in LA. I mean, we live around excess. True. We know lots of people who have. Houses that are way too big and way too expensive. Yeah. And, you know, really the truth is how much does one need to be happy? Well, if what you want is to be rich, if that's your definition of success, you'll never be happy because there's never enough rich. Mm -hmm. And if you're in de if, But if your definition of success is being good or making something good, you'll, yeah. you'll reach your goal because even if you want more good, goodness, it, it still comes from the same place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for example, I used to know um, a guy named Paul Allen, who was a software guy. Yeah, I've heard know? of him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he had this gigantic private yacht. He actually had four of them. And each one had its own like record plant style recording studio on it, because mm -hmm. he liked to play. He was a musician. Yes. It's, I mean, this Microsoft thing sort of may have gotten, was a in, mark. It might yeah. have gotten in the way of his music career. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But he liked music. Um, but there was another fellow, Paul had this yacht called the Octopus, and it was the largest privately owned yacht in the world at the time. And this other fellow had, was having a yacht built, and he found out that Paul's was bigger. This guy actually put like a 30-foot a, a flagpole, spinner, flagpole kind of thing in front, mm -hmm. uh -huh. so he could say his was longer. 
Okay. So out of all of those millions of dollars for the boat, the only thing he really cared about was that extra 10 or 20 feet that said his boat was longer. So how much is enough? There's no such thing as enough if that's your goal. Because there'll always be a guy with, you know, an, a, a five more dollars. <laughs> you well, know? and you and I both know this. You know, yeah. We know a lot of people who are very well off financially, but mm -hmm. they're not happy. Because the goal is, is the goal is something that can't be attained. Exactly, you know? exactly. Um, and because no matter how much money you make, you still take you with you. Yeah, you can't outrun you. Yeah, And if exactly. you have uh, these things that everybody has that, that sort of makes them unsettled, you'll never shake that off. It'll yeah. always be there. That's too bad, but yeah. what can you do? Yeah. You know? Anyway, so let's, let's get out of this rabbit hole and, yeah. and talk a little bit more about your career because ah. you, at one point or another, obviously focused on... First of all, you focused on being, on really being a bassist, and I think being a bassist is different in so many ways from a lot of other instruments. Yeah. And I think there's a certain, um, a certain big picture perspective that must be attained in order to play that instrument the yeah. right way. You know, when I was young, the bass players that were really, there were some really amazing bass players in the '60s and the '70s. Uh, Jack Bruce, mm -hmm. um, um, Noel Redding, um, uh, James Jamerson, of course, mm -hmm. Paul McCartney. That guy, McCartney guy, yeah. Uh -huh. Man, the bass lines he had Amazing. was, I mean, and of course, Melodic. he, was a, he yeah. was a big James Jamerson fan, too. Mm -hmm. There were certain bass players that really put bass in a different light than maybe the 50s, you know, when they yeah. were basically doing electrified you know, rockabilly kind of thing, you know. Duck done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these <coughs> bass players were making bass parts that were really driving the song. Yeah. Really rhythmic bass parts, but also very melodic, but still somehow managed to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like for example, um, some songs were almost all bass. Like the staple singers, I'll Take You There. There you go. You know, doom. Doom, doo -doo 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 -doo. Boom, yeah. boom. The whole song is the bass, you yeah. know. Yeah. And the most, of, and then there's a little bass solo in it, you know, in the middle section, which was very simple. But again, it, it stand it stands out so much that sometimes if I'm doing like a bass solo, if I jump into that, doom, doo -doo 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 -doo, everybody goes nuts uh -huh. because everybody knows that sound, you know. Yeah. That, so yeah. bass is a great instrument, and you can also build a whole song from bass. Because what I really, really wanted to be was a songwriter. Uh -huh. I just needed to learn other instruments because I couldn't afford to hire session musicians back then. And I really couldn't afford studio time. Sure. Which is why I got that intern job at the recording studio. Because at night when they weren't using the studio, they'd let me use the gear to learn. I did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Long as I put it all back <laughs> in the morning right. when the clients showed up. Right. And so I got to learn how to do it. And I couldn't afford to hire musicians because everybody, you know, they cost money. And so I had to learn how to play guitar. I had to learn how to play the drums. So I had the tools to make the demos I wanted to make of the songs I was writing. Yeah. So yeah. all of it was necessity being the mother of invention. But and it also in engaged you in looking at that whole big picture of how do these parts fit together. Exactly. As a composer. Right. And I think that's important too because... You know, a lot of people, if they dedicate their lives to learning synthesizer, keyboard, mm -hmm. or guitar in particular, right. because those instruments are capable of standing on their own. Right. They don't necessarily think in terms of ensemble. Right. Whereas bass, even though you're right, you know, it can stand on its own, it doesn't typically. And so if you're a bass player, you're thinking about all those other pieces and how they all fit into the puzzle. Here's the thing about bass. You always miss it when it's gone. Right. You know. Exactly. You know. When I stop playing, that's when people <laughs> yeah, notice. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's how fundamental it is. Yeah. It's not that no one cares about bass. It's just that we take for granted that it will be there. It's like gravity or something. Yeah. It'll yeah. be there. Yeah. You know. And without the bass, the whole thing just so bass becomes this engine, this driving thing, this sonic um, uh, thing. Also the. The, the tonal center of the of the song. Yeah. Um, How many and, DJs drop the bass? Oh yeah. Yeah, you know. And then there's the rhythm aspect of it. So yes. if you have a good solid bass part and you've got a good solid melody, then the chords just sort of fall in. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, bass was always my, I mean, my first instrument ever was guitar, but the thing that really attracted me was bass. So I got a guitar when I was six years old, and I played it right away, but I got a bass when I was about nine, a, a bass of my own. Uh -huh. And then after that, it was only bass, yeah. you know. I yeah. mean, I picked up other instruments because I wanted to be able to make music with them, but mm -hmm. I'm a bass player, you know. Every, if you're lucky, you find your instrument. Yeah. yeah. So for me, that's bass. So how did that evolve into composition, into, into creating not just songwriting songs, mm -hmm. but, you know, how, how did that evolve into the art of composing for you? Well... It was all by ear, and it was all just by listening to other music. And so, but I did notice that in the contemporary music of the time, bass was a big sonic part of it. Sure. And then everything else was built on it. So for me, bass became the foundation of whatever else I was writing. And also because you had bass players who sang. So you like Jack Bruce or like Greg Lake or McCartney, Paul McCartney, of yeah. course, that mm -hmm. McCartney keeps popping up. Yep. Um, and other people like that, Getty Lee. So they were playing these bass parts that were not exactly easy, mm -hmm. but they were also singing. And they weren't yeah. singing the bass part, they were singing something else. So the coordination that it took to do both things at the same time was, uh, uh, I happened to have it. And so it worked for me. But a lot of people had a hard time oh, yeah. playing an instrument, rhythm instrument, and singing, especially if you're playing this line and you're singing that melody, and they're not at all the same. I'll give you a, a, yeah. a great story about that. Mm -hmm. um, one summer I was working the Montreux Jazz Festival and yeah. I walked in during sound check on Marcus Miller. Mm. And he's up on stage and he's playing I Want You Back, ah. which as you know, is not an easy bass line. No, especially not the middle, all. especially the middle eight. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And he's playing it flawlessly and he is singing the lead vocal. <laughs> oh, baby! You know, yeah. I just I, I stood there on the edge of the stage, and when he stopped, I just said, "Man, I'm going home and burning all my bases." And he <laughs> laughed, and he said, "No, man, go home practice." Yeah. You know? yeah. But but that kind of coordination, right. I was just I think I was just mesmerized, man, just watching. Yeah. How how your how your the parts of your brain are able to coordinate that? It's so well. It's like playing piano. I mean, yeah. the left hand is going here, the right hand is going, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. or drums, I mean, drums some is people even, are doing yeah, drums some, are even more difficult. all four limbs could be completely independent. Or pedal yeah. steel, with the knees and everything, no. man. Yeah. Pedal steel is like, it's another world. That gets into a, it's almost like a, a, a it's almost like a, a condition, <laughs> you know. If you know what I mean. Yes, I do. Because, I mean, it really <laughs> is. You watch a guy who's really good at pedal steel. They've got the knee bars. They've got the steel itself. they got their hands. they got mm -hmm. the pedals. And there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, a, it's it's really amazing to see. I mean, uh, I had a pedal steel. And I all it really was was a, a, a lap steel on a stand because I could never really do all that extra. Exactly. It's a know. slide guitar for it's me. It's a slide man. guitar, yeah. Yeah. yeah, on legs. But people who can really get that nuance out of it. Oh, yeah. but, as, but as you say, I mean, I think there is this coordination, this, this brain to right. limb coordination that is just, um, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, doing that even as a singing bassist is not easy. And I think it helps to start when you're relatively young on any of those types of instruments because at a certain point, the brain just says, I don't want to do that. That's a yeah. lot of work and I don't see why I should have to do that, you know? I mean, I've been really trying to learn proper piano lately because I played keyboards all my, all my career, mm -hmm. but that's like pecking at a typewriter like this yeah, as yeah. opposed to really you know, and, 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 and keyboards will do it all for you. These yeah. days, they, yeah. they will. Yeah. But if you want to really play with the proper technique and understand, it's hard. And that's why little five-year-olds get piano lessons. Yes. You know, so yes. it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. It'll never be second nature for me to, to play the piano, you know. Well, and that's, you know, that's that interesting transition from the left brain stuff where you're learning the instrument and the technique yeah. to the right brain, you know, improvisational. Right. You know, just like, yeah, I don't even have to think about what I'm playing, you know? Right, yeah. yeah. Like, um, 
who am I thinking of? Like with George Benson. Remember how he used oh, to yeah. do that stuff where he'd like play a line and sing it at the same oh, time, yeah. you know, yeah. and stuff like that. That's I mean, easier yes. than playing piano because yeah, you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same you're thing. You're coordinating with, yeah. these. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But to play to play piano, that's a hard deal. Oh yeah, because you know? your left hand's doing this one thing yeah. down here. You know, I was always fascinated with guys like um, remember Art Tatum. Sure. You know, sure. Guys who can really just like. Wing it, and, and both hands are not just playing independently of each other. They're like on other planets. Right, but they're still in concert with each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, the left hand is doing walking bass, for example, um, and then the right hand is playing a melody. And they, or six. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they're just perfectly happy doing what they're doing. And, and, and then if you consider like a B3 player, like Groove Holmes or something, oh, yeah. now there's bass pedals. Exactly. And like, okay, just stop it. Just yeah, cut it out. Yeah. Now, at this point, you're just showing off. But... Uh, <laughs> But no, I, I I think it's all, it's amazing what people can do. But that's, you know, so for me, it was just, you know, the bass was a great way to have a, a solid foundation and then sing a melody on top. And I would imagine the chords in between. Uh-huh. And then eventually I could just make chords because then I would add another, you know, but to, you needed a multi-track of yeah. some kind. Yeah. And, um, and again, that's why the studio I worked at was so handy because... I could experiment with all of that at a at a no risk um, situation. Right. You know, um, the worst that happened was I, I used a roll of tape that I had to buy, but I could just keep reusing that roll of tape because it was not yeah. like stuff was getting released. Mm. You know, I was still yeah. learning how to do it. But just roll off a two track mix and yeah. Start again. Yeah, and yeah. start again. Mm-hmm. And so, but hey, at two hundred bucks a reel, man, you kidding? Yeah, but you could use that reel a lot of times, yeah, especially because exactly. you didn't think you were saving it. You're just gonna erase it and try again. Yeah. But the point was that if I had a good bass line, I had a good melody, I could work on chords. And then another fortunate thing for me was I eventually ran into uh, Earl Clue, the guitar player, because he lived in Detroit too. Oh. And um, there was this little club that he used to play at. And um, he kind of graduated from it, and I started playing there with this other combo, but he still would come and hang out all the time. Uh-huh. And um, so eventually we struck up a, com- a friendship, and he was really instrumental in teaching me about real writing music, mm-hmm. and especially how to write a song from a melodic and chord point of view. Because Earl's music at the time was... It's like you couldn't go anywhere without hearing it at a restaurant or at a sure. nightclub or in a, even in an elevator. I mean, and in Europe even more so because mm-hmm. it was all instrumental <coughs> jazz and uh, contemporary jazz and no language barrier because there were no lyrics. Right. And those melodies were beautiful and it was popular everywhere. And he, he, he taught me about melody. And his favorite um, artist was um, Jobim. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And he would talk about how economical Jobim's melodies are. And like, because like the girl from Ipanema, he would just use the same three notes and keep changing the chords. Yes. And so it's like, you don't have to work so hard, you know, just make the three notes that everybody likes. But you it know? was the choice of chords. Precisely. You know, because those like, chords yeah. made all the difference to that same three notes. Yeah. But that shows you the relativity between the, the melody and the harmony, you know. Well, and that's also, um, I think, in turn, you know, when you talk about songwriting, there's yeah. a certain intuitiveness there yeah. of, you know, how, how this particular change is going to affect the mood. Right. You know, and right. that's, I mean, Jobim was a, truly a master at that. Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, I, I followed that little example for the rest of my career. You know, trying to make an economical use of melody by augmenting it with a change in harmony. And that made for songs that you could sing along with. Because there's a consistency factor exactly. there. Yeah, I which was, is what humans want. But the, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I tell young musicians all the time when I'm in the studio producing them, I say, you know, you, yeah, the first verse is how you teach people the song. Yeah. So that yeah. means on the second verse, you can't just go in some other crazy direction. Right. You can add a little something yeah, and augment it and build it. But, but don't change yeah. the whole melody because you will have so much more to say. Because the payoff is the fact that by the time the second verse comes around, the audience is kind of familiar with the song. Yeah. yeah. And now they can join in. Yeah. But, if, yeah. but if the whole thing is, no, you sit there and watch me as I soar. 
you know, what will happen then is, well, they just, they start doing that. Yeah, know? and, well, you know, it, it, certainly there is a place for um, what we would call, you know, progressive, mm -hmm. you know, um, outside stuff, jazz, whatever, you right. know. But I think if you're talking about, and I hate to use the term like pop, but, yeah. um, you know, music that is uh, deemed accessible by the yeah. masses. Yeah. Yeah. Repetitiveness is a gift. Well, people and it's a like gift it. Yeah. And you it, know, that's and why it's called pop music. It's popular. And, and people like it. They like to feel like they're part of it. They like to feel like they're not left out of it. That's why the Australians make such great rock records, ACDC and the yeah, NXS, yeah. because every song they make, you can be like, you know, you can yeah. sing along, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and if you think about it, that dates back, like, really to the beginnings of music. Oh, you yeah. You know, like the sacred monody and, yeah. and, and all of that. I mean, it was people singing the same things over and over again. This repetitiveness. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is, is, it's, a, it's a human con uh, communication. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean even going back to the, the Buddhist temples, the, yeah. the, the monks, uh, the same idea. If it's got a good beat, I can dance to it. Yeah. You know? yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> I just got this great mental image. No, no never mind. <laughs> but honestly, people like to feel like they're part of something. They like to feel yeah. like they're, you know, yeah. and, and people like to take songs to heart. I always tell, mm -hmm. again, it's one of those things I always say to people, young people especially, when you hear someone saying they're playing our song, they mean it. This is our yeah, song now. Yeah. And because if, it means something to us. To us. Yeah. And yeah. if you don't do that, you have failed as a, a songwriter. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean, if your song doesn't get taken up by other people as their song, then all you've been doing is talking to yourself. Well, and, and that's an interesting point because... I've always felt like the ability to play music is a gift. Yeah. And music itself is a gift. Yes. So to be able to convey that and bring those emotions out in other people, that's the greatest gift of all. Yeah, that's the whole point. It's yeah. We're in the communication business. You know, we're communicating feelings and ideas and emotions and thoughts. We're not in the look at me business. You know, sadly, that's not always perceived that way. But yeah, it's but true. the ones who succeed know that. Yes. You know, yes. successful people know that. Yeah, you're going to look at me. I'm on stage, but I'm really a, a proxy for you. I'm here for you. Yeah. This performance is for you. Yeah, exactly. Another example I always <clears throat> use is greeting cards. You know, you buy a greeting card because somebody wrote this card that says the words that you wish you could say yeah. if you were clever with words like these people are. Yeah. And well, songs are the same thing. Songs are the same yeah. thing. And I think, you know, a song, a really well-written song is, yeah. it's a three-minute movie. Yeah. And it's a movie that you can relate to. You right. Know? I've always, you know, one of the things that I learned as a songwriter is, you got to set the stage in the first couple of lines. Right. You know? There's. Uh, I, I used an example the other day. I was talking to somebody. Um, the song "Tempted" by Squeeze. Oh, great song! Brilliant song. Yeah. And if you just think about the opening lines. Oh yeah. Know, I bought a toothbrush, a toothpaste, a flannel for my face. You yeah. Know? And you immediately you have this mental image. This guy is breaking up with his yeah. significant other, and he's moving on to a new life. Yeah, he's he going like, somewhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you, you get this whole scenery in yeah. your head of the car, you know, driving yeah. and everything. And it, it's just, it's brilliant. And right. it's brilliant in the sense that it tells the story. Right. But it doesn't tell such a detailed story. Right. It, it, it leaves enough holes for you to yeah. conjure that. Well, yeah, it's really writing a story. And it's still got a little bit of funk to it. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, so a lot that, of funk to it. Yeah. yeah it's a great so, song. Yeah. And so it's really something. Um, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you can pull people into this this scenario, and now they're they're invested in the story. Where's this guy going? What's he up to? What happened to him? Yeah. Why is this happening? And eventually they're like, Yeah, I've done that, or that happened to me, or mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. And or, now it's, or something similar. Yeah. But yeah, you, you give yeah. them points to relate to. Right. It's that's, true. If if you're trying to make songs for audiences to love. That's the, that's, that is the goal. Yeah. The question is, is that your goal? Now, some people want to write songs that are very specific to their life experience, 
But the only ones that become successful are the ones whose life experience just happens to be one that other people, it still goes back to do other people relate to it. Because if they don't, if you really were a guy who lived in a cave on the side of a mountain and, 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 and never saw anyone but three goats and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and this bird that would come every other day, then it's very rare that other people are going to be like, oh, yeah, man. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I can relate. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, that's just not usual, you know. Yeah. And it's yeah. very frustrating as a producer also when I meet people who want to make the most inaccessible music but still want it to sell 20 million copies. You know, yeah. they want to make something that's so odd and unusual but they still want everyone to love it yeah i said you live by the sword you die by the sword you can make esoteric unusual music but it's not reasonable to expect it to satisfy the masses yeah, yeah. now if you do want to satisfy the masses that's a whole different story but if you want to do this unique special thing do it if it makes you feel fulfilled just don't expect this outrageous financial reward because that's not reasonable well, not just the outrageous financial reward, but also the don't expect it to touch as many people because yeah. the more universal you can make it, right. the more people it's going to touch. And part of that, I think, is, to my mind, making it, leaving a lot of openings, leaving right. a lot of things that can be open to interpretation. Right. It's like the difference between reading a book and seeing the movie. Right. If you read the book you have a mental image of the characters, of what they look like, of what, you know, all yeah. of this, whereas the movie just lays it all right out there. Right. You know, right. Harry Potter now looks like, what's the guy's name? Um, I don't know. Yeah, that actor who plays We all yeah, know. We, exactly. I mean, you yeah. know. You all know who it is, but I yeah. can't think yeah. of his name right now. You know now. who, Daniel yeah. Radcliffe. Da thank you, yeah. thank you, yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, before that movie, yeah. he looked like what you had in your head. I wonder if when they cast him, did um, the author say, yeah, that's him, that's Most Harry likely. Potter. Yeah. Most likely, yeah. yeah. But, but still, point being, you know, you're... You would you're, never have... There's, I'm sure if you interviewed the millions of people who read Harry Potter before the, there was a Harry Potter movie, and you asked them to draw a picture of Harry Potter, I'm sure you'd get a million different photos. Easily. Drawings, you know. Easily, yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah, yeah, that's 100% true. Mm -hmm. But with music, it was like that. So to me, I wanted to make songs that people liked. Mm -hmm. And again, I grew up in that era of really good popular songs. You know, Simon and Garfunkel, Carly Simon, uh, all the Simons. Um, <laughs> and then, but of course, the Beatles, and of course, you know, Cream, and, and even the progressive bands like Yes. I mean, the funny thing is, the same pop stations that play, you know, bands like, uh, artists like Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga and stuff, used to play Steely Dan. Yeah. And before that, they played Yes, <laughs> you well, know. Now, and so... And let's think about Yes for a minute. You know, yeah. if you think about their early stuff, mm -hmm. it was very structured. It oh, was yeah. not, you know, I mean, progressive is a term that is so vague, you yeah. know, even though it's now applied to a certain type of, you know, prog rock or whatever. But right. their early stuff was very melodic. There were there were refrains, there were hooks, right. there were, you know, there was a song structure in that sense. Which gets us back to the beginning. If you want to have something successful, people have to relate to it. They have to be able to sing with it. They yep. have to be able to take it in. Roundabout um, was very, very catchy. Even yeah, yeah. back to the bass, the bass line yep. was really catchy and yep. it was really great and it sounded great on the radio. Yeah, yeah. And um, there were a lot of bands like that at the time. Yep. And but that but even in in the more modern era, bands like industrial music, there were a lot of bands that were really abrasive, Skinny Puppy, Ministry, Front Two Forty Two. Yeah, but yeah. then came Nine Inch Nails, just as abrasive, but with choruses. Yes, exactly. With you hooks. could sing along. Exactly. Yeah. That's why Trent Reznor became a superstar because his music you could sing to. It was accessible. Yeah, it was yeah. accessible. Mm -hmm. It was still just as uncompromising um, production-wise and just as amazing in that regard, but in terms of you, the listener, mm -hmm. you could say, yeah, I can sing with that. I can be part of that. Yeah. You know, so it all comes back to the same thing. We're in the communication business. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. take a hard right here now yeah. and, and talk about 
Um, I know you've done some composing, mm -hmm. film co composition. Yeah. I know you also have a fascination with the music of Alfred Hitchcock. Yes. You know, um, yeah. and which is, you know, I mean, what better place to draw from? But what led you into that direction? Well, watching movies, you know, I mean, watching all those movies when I was younger and, and, and the, again, the difference between today's movies and the movies of the past was, one, how much more music there was in those movies. Sure. Well, let me put it another way, how much music you could hear. Uh -huh. And also how little, how much more room or gaps there were in dialogue. Leaving the music to help you understand what was going on. Okay, but play, playing devil's advocate here, the music in movies mm -hmm. is, by its very nature, designed to not necessarily be heard. It's perceived, but the best soundtracks are those that you don't even really notice in that sense. Well, that's because they were so well written, but yes. even so, today is different than it was. I mean, mm -hmm. Psycho is a great movie, Yeah, yeah. but there are parts of Psycho that go five, six minutes without anybody saying a word. And yes, it's yes. only music. Yeah. And there's not sound effects back then. I mean, there's not explosions like a Marvel movie or something. Like uh, the, the scene in Psycho where Marion Crane stole this money and she's driving in the rain and the windshield wipers are going back and forth. And all you see is her face mm -hmm. and these various expressions on her face as she's thinking about what she's done. And this music. Dun -na, dun -na, dun -na. Yeah. And yeah. the music is driving the car. The music is driving us through the rain. It's driving the whole plot. It's driving the whole, it's yes, telling it's us what's story. going on. Absolutely. That's what I mean. The yeah. music was very upfront at that point because there's nothing else. Yeah. The only other thing you could hear is sort of the, <coughs> the general ambience of a car going through the rain and the windshield wipers. But even that was not that much. But there was nobody talking. Yeah. And nothing yeah. was blowing up. Uh -huh. And there was, there was, so it was all music. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, so in that regard, back then, almost every mu movie, um, the music really helped you understand how to feel. And it wasn't subliminal. Today's yeah. music has to be because most movies today have a whole lot more dialogue, but they also have so many other elements, you know, FX, um, explosions, car noises. Sure. Um, they put a lot of stuff sound-wise in movies today because they can. Yeah. They, got, they got endless tracks of Pro Tools of, 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 of Foley and FX and dialogue sure. and yeah. background noises and extra crowd and, and, and uh, Casablanca, movies like that, they just didn't have that. That's true. They you basically know? had an orchestra yeah. and And that dialogue. was recorded in mono yeah. all at once. <laughs> yeah. And um, they didn't have room for that. And they also didn't have the dynamic range to mix it that way. So are you more attuned to older type soundtrack music in that sense? In the, yeah, because uh, th those things you can actually perform. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, you could take music like Alfred Hitchcock, his main composer that everyone recognizes is Bernard Herrmann. Mm -hmm. He used other composers too, but Bernard Herrmann was the one who did his, pretty much most of his most memorable films, Psycho, Marnie, the, the Birds, which was a very interesting story, North by Northwest, um, so on. So when people think of Alfred Hitchcock, they kind of think of Bernard Herrmann. Uh -huh. But the pieces he wrote for those movies, the melodies were so strong that they stand alone as music that you could perform. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, a lot of today's movie music, although it works in the context of a picture, if you listen to it by itself, it's literally a lot of times just sort of tones. It's ambient. Yeah, yeah. Because uh -huh. it's that's all they can squeeze in. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, otherwise it's distracting to all that other stuff is going on. So mm -hmm. if there's a lot of dialogue, then it's really hard to also put a lot of melody. And it's also if there's a lot of sound effects, there's a, it's hard to stick. Where are you going to? What the orchestra going to do without stepping on somebody else? Sure. And then there are movies that if you could hear the soundtrack, the score you'd find there's a lot more going on than you think. It's just that they shove it so back in the mix because all this other stuff is going on. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of composers, it's gotten to the point now where in the past, a composer would watch the movie and then he'd write around whatever was going on and there'd be moments where the orchestra could really shine or the score, and then there'd be moments where it's more like, 
this uneasy feeling as the person's going through the hallway mm -hmm. or whatever. But now, what some composers, a lot of composers are unfortunately doing now because they are kind of forced to, is it's almost like they're making just general music tracks, which means the real composer is the music editor. Uh -huh. Because the music yeah. editor takes all that music and chops it up and puts it in the scenes mm -hmm. and the director. And so the composer is no longer given this six minute scene and asked, make music specifically to this scene. It's now just make music. Like when Trent Reznor yeah. did the social network, which got him an Oscar, he said, I made just a whole bunch of music and gave it to them and they figured out where to put it. Yeah, it's a completely different art form. It's a different way to do it. Yeah. And, um, and directors love it <coughs> mm -hmm. because it gives them absolute control over how the music goes with everything else. Sure. And music editors um, like it because it lets them sort of help shape the, the music for the picture. The problem is you don't end up with music uh, that you, the music process itself is it, it's just not the same. It can't be the same. It's not, yeah, it's not created for the scene. It's not specifically made for yes. the scene. And, that's and even if you made something for the scene, you still have to leave enough room that they can change yeah, it, you know. Sure, exactly. So that because who knows what they're going to do once you turn it in. Mm -hmm. Now there's still some films that are made a little more the old-fashioned way, mm -hmm. but that's why we call it the old-fashioned way because a yeah. lot of movies are just they just have a different methodology now. Sure, and know? that's uh, you know a lot of that is up to the director and. Well, it's all up to the know. director, and directors <laughs> tend to like having control over every element, mm -hmm. and if they can now take this music. And because in the old days, Bernard Herrmann or somebody like that, uh, John Williams, um, when he did Jaws, uh, guys like that, they just had a piano. Yeah, yeah. And the director came in and they would play this on a piano. Uh, da, 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 da. And you had to imagine it was an orchestra. Yeah. Which yeah. meant the director had to have at least enough musical acumen to sort of picture these things. Because the next time you heard it, it was orchestrated, and there was 50 guys out there sawing on violins. And being paid scale. And being paid scale, <laughs> yeah. And so I think that that was, they had to be able to sort of picture it. Well, and that, you know, that's analogous also to A&R people today, you know, versus years ago. I mean, yeah. years ago you'd play somebody a demo tape, and they would have to see the potential in the right. song and in the artist. Right. Whereas... You know, now you better give me a completely finished and yeah, high level demo. Yeah, make me a record. Demo. Yeah, exactly. Make me a record. And if I like it, you know, I'll yeah. steal some parts from it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's become that. Yeah. But it's just like now that we have GPS, we can't remember where things are. And just now that we have... We don't have remember a, people's phone numbers exactly. anymore. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now that we have uh, this ability to have demos delivered that are really basically finished, um, I don't know a single composer who doesn't have a, 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 a rig in their studio that lets Absolutely. them make Absolutely. really orchestra demos that are, if you don't, uh, for a lot of people, if they didn't know any better, they would think it was the real, the orchestra. Sure. That's how much detail has to go into your demo now before the director will approve it. They really want to hear exactly how it's going to sound. But you know you what's know? a shame about that is that it creates a situation where you're creating in a vacuum. You're not getting as much feedback. You're not getting as much give and take from the musicians or any of that stuff. No, by the time you get to <coughs> the music approved, um, then you go in the studio with an orchestra, we're just putting this stuff down. Yeah. We're not like, there's yeah. no more of that. Yeah, let's try it like this. Now it's like, this has already been signed off on exactly. by five different departments. Don't change anything. And yeah. there's no changing at this yeah. point. It's like, yeah. okay, now we're just running that's why the recording sessions go so fast, but scale is expensive. You got 100 musicians at, at, at Abbey Road. Uh, you know, it's like, we got to yeah. top, top, top. Exactly. Let's get this going. Or even better yet, just give me your Pro Tools file. Right. You know? Yeah. Th that, that's the thing is that, you know, nobody wants to spend that kind of time or money anymore. And also, there is much more of an immediacy of, we got to get this out there now. Yeah. The thing, <laughs> and, and, and to me, the thing that's a shame about that is it's still not that much money. When you compare yeah. it to how much t money it cost to make, you know, the Hulk, uh, yeah. his face do this, 
You know, right. that one the little CGI thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that probably cost 20 million bucks, Easily. you know. Yeah. Um, but for the orchestra to cost a couple hundred thousand, it's like, are we, we're out of money. We can't afford that, you know. Well, you know, and music was always the, the last thing people budgeted for. We know yeah. that anyway. Yeah. But it was, it used to be at least prominently displayed, you mm -hmm. know. So what got me into wanting to be a composer was hearing those great compositions. Sure. And um, I knew I wouldn't be a classical composer because, well, who is? And I mean, we already got Beethoven. Those guys are all dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the audience for classical music really is an audience that wants classical yes. music. Yes. You know, so it's it, that's why they keep having mostly Mozart concerts and 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 yeah. and, and, and that kind of thing. That stuff's you know? already been written. And what also has become super super popular is at the Hollywood Bowl and places like that where they have an orchestra play Raiders of the Lost Ark yeah, yeah. while they show Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, so you can yeah. hear a real orchestra playing the exact same score, mm -hmm. but now you're hearing the, the weight and the, the air and the power of a real orchestra. So you feel like you're seeing, but that's become the new classical music. Yeah. There are yeah. classical stations now that play movie music. Sure, absolutely. To fill in their playlist, because mm -hmm. how many times can you hear Beethoven's Fifth, you know? So the, the <clears throat> that music has become sort of the new classical music. Some yeah. of the original, uh, what was considered film music, which was almost like pop music in its day. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it's amazing to me that so much of that great music was recorded on tape. You know, Star Wars was recorded on tape. Yeah, of there course. There was no Pro Tools yet. Yep. You know, it's yep. fascinating. And any of the edits were done with a razor blade. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you better get it right. Which means you got to have a guy who knows what he's doing. Yeah. I yeah. think all the, that's the last part of it. I think what I appreciate about, of it, about a lot of it is it's the care that went into making it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Because these people really cared. They wanted to get it right. They wanted it to be good. They didn't want to mess it up. And they were and engaged. They're very they were engaged. so engaged in the process. Yeah. And I think that's that's so important. Yeah. If you're really doing a good job at something, you care. You're engaged oh, yeah, absolutely. fully. So when I first came to California from Michigan, um, the first guy I got to work with was Paul Buckmaster, who um, is popularly known as an arranger who did all the early Elton John records. Um, oh. He did of course, Mad Men Across the Water and Daniel and, and all these great songs and really gave Elton John that majestic orchestral sound that we all know. Mm -hmm. Take Me to the Pilot, all those great <coughs> songs with that yeah. great orchestra, yeah. Leave On. And when I got here, I got a job as his studio assistant. So I was control. I was, I was kind of keeping all his, his MIDI, his samplers, all his studio gear running while uh -huh. so he could compose. Uh -huh. And fortunately for me, he took enough of a, a liking to me to every now and then teach me a little tidbit about composing or uh -huh. about arranging or about writing music for a specific scene. You know, he was very famous for the movie 12 Monkeys with Bruce Willis and all that. He wrote the score to that. And he would show me how to do something and then he'd say, I have to go out for a coffee. Uh, this scene's only 10 seconds long. Uh, I'll see what you can do. Uh, and then I'd, I'd try, you know. And then he'd, I'd, he'd come back and he'd say, well, this is what's wrong with that. You know? But my mistakes was, were the things that taught me what to do and what not to do. Let's talk a little bit about... Um somebody starting out at this point because as you said you you came up in a different era yeah and music was different film was different um what are the challenges for somebody coming up now the challenges today are they're not all that different if you look at it from the big picture the challenges today are that the traditional record business or movie business is not where it used to be. It's literally not located where it used to be. Yeah. It used to be you go to New York City, you go to Los Angeles, you go to Nashville, one of those music meccas. Yeah. Now it's very distributed. You can be anywhere now and make music. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be anywhere now and find a band. You can be a 
a globe. You don't have to fly to Australia to find the next NXS. You know, they're online. Yeah, you, know? yeah. Um, you can live stream them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, on the other hand, that means that before they find you, they have to, you've got to really have your act together, you know, Take a Super Tramp, take a Leonard Skinner, take a band that is now a catalog band. Um, their first couple of records weren't popular. Right. You know, it took a while. The biggest pressure that young artists are under today is this need to, especially pop type artists, they don't get a second chance that much. No, deliver it done. Yeah. yeah. And it better be a hit. Yeah. And part of that is because the A&R community is so. Um, everybody has pressure now. Yep. You know, it's sort of like the 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 Walmart effect, in yes. that you have to. If you made a product, I remember watching this show about a guy who made a simple thing, which was basically like a holder for Post-it notes that uh-huh. you could like mount on, like on your refrigerator, mm-hmm. and he was selling it at little stores. And one day he got an appointment to sell it at Walmart, to, to go to the big, where, the big headquarters and show it to them. Uh-huh. And uh, they liked it. And they said, you know what? We're going to carry your product at Walmart. And the, for him, it was what he thought was the greatest day of his life. Because he had friends who had helped him with the materials and friends who had helped him with the design. And they had all kind of done him favors, hoping that one day this would pay off for everyone. But once they got his deal at Walmart, what happened is Walmart said, okay, we love your product. We're going to do it. But could you make it a little cheaper? And so he had to go down the line to all his people and say, could we all give up a little bit? But it's for Walmart. We're going we're gonna to sell a billion of these. And then they said, the shape of it doesn't quite fit on our displays. Can you redesign? By the time they were done making all these changes, it cost him all the profit that he was going to make. So the good news was that Walmart carried his product. The bad news is that Walmart carried his product. Right, right. Because now he could sell a billion of them and not make any money. And how do you do that? When all your friends are patting you on the back, you must be really rich now. Well, the problem with the music business is it's the same thing. You really have to have a, a smash hit success on day one. Because if you're a pop singer, the next Britney Spears or the next whatever... There's not another chance, right. you know. Even people who have a hit, if they don't have another one, they're yeah. gone. Yeah. So the pressure is on artists to to succeed uh, fast, yeah. because the pressure is on A and R guys to succeed fast. An A and R guy could sign a band in the old days and say, "Well, okay, the first couple of records they're finding their way, but on record three or four, we're really going to have a home run," yeah. and that's usually what happened. But also, it, it spreads out the problem. So if the record doesn't succeed, the A&R guy can say, I don't know what happened. I'm, I even hired, and I brought, here's my list. Yeah. So everyone's afraid of failing. Mm-hmm. In the old days, no one was afraid of failing because no one expected to, sell, to be a success. And therefore, people made original music that was good. So my advice to anyone is, do what you really want to do. Don't listen now, don't be stupid, but don't listen to things that go against your grain. Yeah. But make sure it's not just your ego. It gets back to why did you go into the music business? Did you go into music to make the music you wanted to make? Or did you go into music to make money and then become the next spokesman for a major product? Right. <clears throat> because if you wanted to make music, the music is your reward. And if you keep making music, you will be a successful person on some level. Right. You will have an audience on some level. Yeah. But if your goal all along was to be Coca-Cola presents Mike Bradford, well then that's a whole different industry, that's a whole different business and and that's not the music business. Yeah. You know, that's the entertainment, celebrity, whatever, but it's not music. Yeah. You know. So the real question is, everybody has to ask themselves, what do you really want? And you got to be honest, because there's nobody here but you. You have to get to that point where I'm going to make what I make, and hopefully people will like it. The good news is now with the internet, now with YouTube, now with Instagram and all the other things, 
you can reach people without a major budget from a marketing division of a major record company. Yeah. But everyone else is trying to do the same thing. And the difference between now and 50 years ago is now, instead of being the biggest band in America, you can be a not so big band, but have 10 million fans, Japan, Sweden, yeah. you know, all over the world. Yep. You could theoretically cobble together around the world a bunch of people who like what you like. Yeah. And you can reach them. Yeah. So, but are you willing to do it? Because if you boil it all down, no matter what century it is, it gets back to the very basic thing. Are you willing to get in the van and go places and let people like you one city at a time? Yeah. Now that van might be a virtual van now, but are you willing to go through that period when you're not a superstar overnight? Can you wait that long? I mean, I talk to kids and they say, well, well, look at you. Of course you say that. You've sold 30 million records. But what they don't know is all the nights we played in empty places where nobody, where people said, we don't want that music, where people would throw things at you, yeah. where people, you know, you're, you go out in the parking lot, your window's broken because they stole your stuff. Nobody sees all that. Right. You know, can you do it? I mean, that's really the question. You know, do you know what you're asking for? Yeah. Do you really know what you're signing up for? And, and that's the challenge. But for those who know, they understand, and they still go anyway, he who lasts longest wins. Michael Bradford, thank you for being my guest. <laughs> thank you, man. <laughs> always that's good. Awesome, man. Always good to talk to you. Likewise. Absolutely. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.